healing. I believe in God being a good God. Don't get nervous. <laughs> but we're going to talk about the judgment of God. So uh, that, believe it or not, is what we're going to talk about. And it's we're going to hit some scriptures that I guarantee you, you may have never seen before. Because most word of faith people don't want to deal with these scriptures. Praise the Lord. That's okay. Uh, the title for tonight is God Judges Righteous Judgment. And uh, this is taken from a message, I'll give credit where credit is due, taken from a message by Keith Moore, and it is a powerful, powerful message. So we're going to dive right into it after we pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and receive from your word. We thank you, Father, that we have this time set aside to receive from your word and to just take time to have the Holy Spirit teach us and minister to us. And so, Father, we give him free course here tonight to teach and to minister in any way that he sees fit. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, let's look at the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 24. John seven twenty four. It says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And that's where we get the title for our message, that God judges righteous judgment. Now, we know that we're not supposed to judge according to the outward appearance. That would be, well, you know, this guy's dressed to the nines. He's got a tux on. He must be rich. So we're going to appeal to him. That's judging by the appearance. Well, we don't do that. Uh, at the same time, if he's dressed like a bum, we don't judge based on that either. So the appearance is not what's important. God looks at the heart. And so we want to judge righteous judgment both knowing that we should be doing that, but also that God does that. God's our example in that regard. Now, I want us to consider a situation, have that at the forefront of our mind, before we get into the meat of the teaching. So let's talk about Paul in Acts chapter 22. Paul in Acts chapter 22. Now, Here's a situation with Paul where they've hauled him up in front of the magistrates and the scribes and the Pharisees that brought him in and uh, they had him ready to be whipped. They're going to punish him. And, you know, Jesus, when he was under the same situation, same circumstance, he didn't open his mouth. He didn't defend himself. He didn't say anything that would have dissuaded him from beating it. And uh, of course the reason for that is is because Jesus bore what he bore for us. Okay? So by his stripes that he was beaten with, we are healed. And he was, as the scripture says, as a lamb was led to the slaughter, he didn't open his mouth. But now Paul, <laughs> in Acts chapter 22, when he was about to be whipped, he went, whoa, wait a minute. Is it legal to, to whip me and judge me because I'm a Roman? And the, uh, you know, the Roman guards there that were about to whip him said, wait a minute, uh, you're a Roman? And uh, they, they called their boss. They said, hey, boss, come over here. This guy says he's a Roman. So the centurion comes over and says, well, with a lot of money did I purchase my citizenship. And Paul said, yeah, but I was free born. And the centurion goes, uh-oh. <laughs> So they backed off real quick. They said, okay, uh, Mr. Paul, I'm sorry. You know, uh, <laughs> Don't tell anybody that we were about to whip you. you know? <laughs> now, what if Paul had remained silent like Jesus did? He'd have been whipped, right? So whose control, whose power was it under as to whether he got whipped or not? It was Paul's. All Paul had to do was speak up. Well, see, we are in Paul's situation, not Jesus' situation. I had a lady argue with me one time that uh, in order to emulate Jesus, we had to take persecution and get beat up and slapped around, and she even prayed for people's sickness and disease to come on her, you know, bearing it for them. Needless to say, she was a bit on the squirrely side. Uh, that's not what we're supposed to do. We don't bear other people's sickness and disease. We don't bear their sins. We're not Jesus. Jesus did that for us. So we don't have to get the whipping. 
And that's why Paul said, hold on guys, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm a Roman. In other words, he appealed to a higher authority. And that's what we've got to do. We've got, when we are in a situation that we're about to be persecuted, whipped, beaten, whatever, we say, hold on, is it legal for you to punish a blood-bought Christian devil? <laughs> See, the devil is the centurion in this case. You know, hold on now. You know, is it legal? Is it lawful for you to do this? No, it's not, because Jesus bore mine. Same thing with sickness and disease. Jesus bore my sickness. He carried my disease. So by his stripes we were healed. Well, I don't have to bear them. It would be a miscarriage of justice for me to bear them. So what we want to look at, keep that in the back of your mind, that whole scenario about stand it up for yourself. Okay, and then let's get into some other scriptures here. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 39. This is... Uh, this is one of those scriptures we don't read very often. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. See now that I, so this is God speaking, see now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Ooh, hold on. I mean, this, this looks a whole lot like God's the one doing the, making people sick. You know, and we know that God is the one that heals, not the one that makes sick. So what's this all about? Well, let's keep going here. 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 6. 1 Samuel, you want to just write these down. You can always look at them later instead of trying to jump in here because we've got a lot to cover. 1 Samuel 2, 6. The Lord killeth. And maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave, and he bringeth up. Now see, yeah, as I said, this is not a scripture that a lot of word of faith people just want to meditate on and confess and repeat. But it's in the Bible. So what are we going to do with it? The Lord killeth and maketh alive. Well, let's let's go one more. Hosea. Chapter 6, verse 1. Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. That looks to me like the smiting is coming from the Lord. Now, how can this be? Uh, one more. Job. <laughs> Chapter 5, verse 18. For he maketh sore, and bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. So, I mean, it looks like God's kind of double-minded here almost. We know that can't be the case. So there's got to be something at work here. There's got to be something we're missing. Well, when Keith Moore was teaching this, he made a statement, and I wrote it down because it is a, an excellent, excellent statement. He said, Scripture, language, frequently attributes or attributes directly to God actions that he merely permits. I'm going to read that again real slow. Scripture language frequently attributes directly to God actions that he merely permits. Now we've heard before there is a permissive sense to verbs in Hebrew and there's a causative sense to verbs in Hebrew. In these cases, these are permissive uses. God wounds is God allows people to be wounded. God kills is God allows people to be killed. Well, but Dr. Bill, I mean, if he allows it, it must be his will. I mean, you know, doesn't that mean that God is making people sick and... What does that mean as far as our theology is concerned? Well, now, hold on, hold on, don't get all nervous. You know, like I said, I'm a word of faith teacher. I believe God's the healer and God's the blesser. So there is a reason for this. The reason is, in every case that I read here, it was talking about judgment. Judgment came on the people because of their sin and because of their unconfessed sin. Okay? 
And even in that case, it wasn't God's will. Now, how can we say that? I mean, it says God allowed it, so how could it not be his will? Because even though it is the permissive sense, we've got a scripture that's really enlightening. Uh, Exodus 12, I will pass through, this is talking about, and I, I'm trying to kind of shorten this as much as I can to, because we know the story very well. In Exodus chapter 12, uh, God said, this was Passover, the original first Passover. He said, you know, the death angel is going to come and he's going to kill the firstborn. And what I want you to do is put blood on the, the mantle there. And when I see the blood, the destroyer will pass by. Well, now, you got to ask yourself the question, was it God killing the firstborn? No, the destroyer was. Well, who's the destroyer? John 10.10, 10, the devil. Satan comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. Matter of fact, the way John 10.10 10 reads, it says, Satan cometh not but for two. Now, don't you love King James? I mean, it... it it, it says that all the way around your elbow to get to the point of saying there's only one reason he comes. Killing, stealing, and destroying. That's his nature. That's what he wants. That's what he wants to do to people. So God doesn't have to talk him into killing, stealing, and destroying. All he's got to do is just say, I can't protect them. In other words, I have to permit it, not because I want to, but because they refused to repent or they did not obey my word and I've taken it as far as I can with my mercy. God's always merciful. He always wants to bless and not to hurt. And he doesn't hurt. He's not the one that does the killing. He's not the one that does the destroying. Yeah, but he allows it. Yeah, but he allows it because he has to because of judgment. Because if you break the law, over and over and over, and you get out beyond God's mercy, there comes a time, as they say, you got to pay the piper. And unfortunately, that's what happened with the children of Israel. Now, I'll get a little bit ahead of myself here, but over in Hosea, it talks about, I believe it's Hosea, where it talks about that the children of Israel were so in to sin, they were sacrificing their own children to demon spirits, to other gods. Now, God told his prophet, look, those are my kids. Those are my children. Now, you've got to ask yourself the question. If you were God, <laughs> now, thank God we're not, because <laughs> we wouldn't have the kind of mercy he has. But if you were God and, they, and somebody was burning up your babies, would you withhold your hand of judgment? There comes a point that you say, all right, enough is enough. And as Keith Moore said when he was teaching this, he said, now if you were God, you'd say, teach you to kill my prophets, <laughs> teach you to kill my kids, <laughs> wipe you out, you know. But see, that's not the way God really initially reacted. He reacted first with mercy. And then he reacted with mercy. Then he reacted with mercy. And he just kept being merciful. And he kept giving them space. And you know, it's like with Jonah. He sent Jonah to warn Nineveh. And when, the, when Nineveh listened to Jonah and repented, God said, all right, don't, don't destroy him. And actually, Jonah got ticked off about it. He said, God, you promised. <laughs> you said you were going to destroy him. Yeah, but they repented. So if it was God's will to destroy him, if that was his heart's desire was to destroy Nineveh, then why didn't he do it? Because they repented. So the way to avoid judgment is repent. <laughs> Simple. All right, let's keep reading here. Uh, okay, you pass through despite the first boy when it occurs. I will not allow the destroyer to come to you because he sees the blood on the, the, the post there. So as I say in my notes here, don't leave me yet. Where we're doing okay, it's all going to turn out all right here. All right, this is another quote from Keith Moore. God passes judgment that allows the destroyer access. Okay? God passes judgment at a certain point when he's exhausted his mercy 
that allows the destroyer access. Judges 2.14 And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them. Now notice, he didn't spoil them. He didn't destroy them. He delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Now, up to this point, they were doing okay. They were fighting their enemies. They were winning. But God had had as much as he could take, and he had to judge. And his method of judgment was just to remove the protection. And the enemies came in and did what enemies do. They destroyed them. Psalm 78, 61. He delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. That's what who Israel was back at the Old Testament. They were his glory. They were his uh, strength. And he loved them. He, they, he looked at them as his children. Like I was talking about the, the, the babies. He looked at it. Those are his babies. You know? He was very father-like to them. A lot of people think that, that God the Father was only God the Father in the New Testament. That he was all, you know, mean and evil in the Old Testament. No. He's always been merciful. He's always been kind. He's always wanted everybody to repent and straighten up and do right and live the way he, they're supposed to live. But there comes a point that he just won't hold his judgment back. And remember what we started out with. He judges righteous judgment. He doesn't judge incorrectly. He doesn't judge according to the appearance. He doesn't say, well, you know, I don't like your look. I'm going to take you out. That's not God. God's merciful. He's kind. He, he wants the best for us. Psalm 78, 61, he delivered his strength into captivity and his glory to the enemy's hand. Why? It was judgment. He allowed the enemy access. It does not please him, nor is it his perfect will. Let's look at Lamentations 3.22. In other words, this is another one of the scriptures we don't look at very often. Lamentations 3.22. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Okay? It's the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. Now, Brother Keith Moore makes this point. He says, think about it. Think about all the disease in the world. All the germs there are out there. All the bacteria. All the viruses. All the people that you're around that are coughing and sneezing and throwing it all over you. You know, how is it that we are constantly sick? Well, we have a good immune system. Where did that immune system come from? That immune system was designed by God to protect your body from getting sick. Sickness is out there. Okay? It came into the world through Adam's transgression. Satan brought it in. He corrupted. See, Satan didn't create sickness and disease. He, corrupt, he cor corrupted health and wellness. Okay? So all he can do, everything he touches is corrupted, is destroyed. So he didn't create sickness. He corrupted health. And so the sickness and disease are out there now. And God is protecting us from that through the systems he's built into the human body, which is the immune system, through good nutrition that we take in, helps protect us. Those are all natural things. But God also has within every person healing. You know, you, you talk to a doctor. Okay, doc, uh, this person comes in, you have to open them up, and you do all your work in there, and you, you knit together things, and you sew up some things, you sew up their skin, how do you heal them? Doctors say, I don't heal them. It's not up to me. The body will heal. Why? That's just what the body does. The body repairs itself. It knits the skin together. How? Well, it's a natural process. Well, how did the natural process happen? Uh, well, I guess evolutionary, I don't know. See, well, the reason they don't know is it's God. 
God put within everybody, everybody, the natural process of healing. But it is a supernatural manifestation, really, because if you go down far enough and you go down to why those cells come together and why blood coagulates and how it all comes together and begins to heal, you know, they don't really know why that happens exactly. It's called healing. Now, here's the thing about that. There's a natural process of healing. You cut your finger, it heals. You know, I, I get a kick out of people and say, I don't believe in healing. Oh, really? <laughs> you don't believe in healing? Oh, uh, what happens when you cut your finger? Oh, well, you know what I mean. I, I, of course, my finger is going to get healed up, and the scab is going to form, and eventually that scab is going to go away. And, uh, you know, of course, that's healing. But you said you didn't believe in healing. Well, you know what I mean. I don't mean that kind of healing. I, I mean God's kind of healing. Why isn't that God's kind of healing? Didn't God create the person in the first place? Didn't the whole creation come into being because he said light be and light was? Didn't he start the whole ball rolling? So that kind of healing is still healing. So what we need to do and we need to consider is when healing is taking place, that's still God, even if it's in the natural. So what we can do is pray that that healing process get turned up, the volume just get turned up, so that the healing process happens faster than it normally would. Left unto itself, it would heal, because God set that process in motion. But you can pray and believe God for that process to happen faster. You know, I mean, right now, we, Karen's in the hospital. I'm believing for her body to heal supernaturally fast. And that can be a miracle. I mean, the Bible itself says that the first miracle that Jesus performed was at the wedding feast of, of, of Cana of Galilee where he turned the water into wine. But what about the second miracle? A lot of people don't think about the second miracle. The second miracle is when he prayed for a guy and the guy was healed as he went. And then it says right after that, this was the second miracle Jesus performed. Well now, by all intents and purposes, looking at that situation, Jesus prayed for the guy and the guy walks away. There was no instantaneous miracle, but he was healed as he went. Time passed. The healing occurred, but it was a miracle. So healing is always a miracle. It's a miracle at a cellular level, or it's an instantaneous miracle, a creative miracle, but either way, it's all part of the same spectrum of healing, okay? That's just a little side thought. That's not part of what we're talking about. That's okay. Uh, let's look at, uh, we're still on Lamentations 3. Let's look just a little further. Lamentations 3.22 said, the Lord's mercies, it's the Lord's mercies were not consumed because his compassions fail not. Verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God's faithfulness is awesome. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23 speaks to the fact that the Lord's mercies, it is the Lord's mercies we're not concerned. Verse, uh, consumed. Verse 31, the Lord will not cast off forever, for he does not afflict willingly. Now the Amplified says it this way. This is Lamentations 3, 33. Lamentations 3.33. For he does not willingly and from his heart afflict or grieve the children of men. Now, that ought to tell us that this allowing stuff to happen out of judgment is not his will. That's not his best. Let's put it that way, okay? That's not where his heart is. I mean, what does the scripture tell us? It's God's will that all men be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 
Well, um, Dr. Bill, if it's, if it's God's will that all men be saved, all men are going to be saved. No, they won't. Because we know the scripture says there are those, unfortunately, that are going to go to hell because they don't receive Jesus Christ as their Lord. They're going to be poured into hell following the coattails of Satan, who's their father. Jesus turned to the scribes and Pharisees and said, Ye are of your father the devil. So, hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. The people, the angels that follow the devil. The third of the hosts that fell from heaven. That's why hell was created. God did it for that reason. Not to put anybody there. Here's something that will blow people's minds when you tell them. God isn't sending anybody to hell. Because it's not his will. But, Unfortunately, those that don't receive Jesus Christ as Lord, he tells you they will end up in hell because they rejected the free gift of salvation. That's not his will. That's not his desire. His heart is not in it, which is what that scripture in the Amplified is saying. His heart is not in the fact that that has to happen, but it has to happen because he is a just God, and justice demands it. All right, let's keep reading. 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, got to look at my notes here, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. This is the situation that we read about that talks about the guy who's living in sin with his father's wife, in other words, his stepmother. And Paul is not happy about this situation. And it says that he delivered unto Satan this guy, for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit would be saved in the day of judgment. Now that's New Testament. We've been reading a lot of Old Testament. And a lot of people would say, well, yeah, but Dr. Bill, that's Old Testament. Well, this is New Testament. The judgment came down from the man of God who said, I'm delivering this guy to the destruction of his flesh. Now, was it Paul's will when he prayed that this guy be destroyed? No. But he wanted his spirit saved. That's the ultimate final outcome that he desired. So he said, look, he's not repenting. We've talked to him. You've talked to him. I've talked to him. He's not going to repent. We're going to deliver him over saved for the destruction of his flesh. Now, the good news is he repented finally. He had enough. <laughs> and, you know, he didn't, he didn't have to suffer that, thankfully. But... Uh, 1 Timothy, now the New Testament scripture, 1 Timothy 1.20. Of whom is Hymenus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may, may learn not to blaspheme. These are two people in the church that were blaspheming God. Well, duh. <laughs> that puts you on very thin ice. Believe me. And God is merciful even in that situation. But there comes a point. Where the man of God basically said, look, these two guys, I've delivered them unto Satan for the destruction of their flesh. Again, hopefully, their spirit gets saved in the end, but their flesh, sorry, they're blaspheming God. All right? Uh, let's think about that. John 10.10, 10, we, we've already talked about the fact that Satan only comes to destroy. There is no mercy with him. If it was up to Satan... He would kill us all now and we'd go home. I mean, that's it. Again, it's only the mercies of God that were not consumed. It's only the mercies of God that were protected. Even Job, situation with Job. Here's a man that the, the scripture says was a righteous man before God. He stood before God righteous because of his faith, not because of his deeds, not because he tithed and gave and all that, but because of his faith. And Satan set his eyes on Job. And Satan basically came before God, which says, you know, the, the, the sons of God, or which is the angels, presented themselves to God, and Satan was there as well. And uh, he basically said, what, what about Job? What about Job? Because Job was beginning to do some things that were not scriptural. Job was sacrificing over and over and over again for his kids. He said, my kids may curse God. You know, my kids may sin. And so I'm going to do these sacrifices over and over and over. Well, he wasn't in faith. He got out of faith. Well, whatever's not of faith is sin. So 
unbeknownst to Job, his divine protection had fallen. The hedge around him had fallen. And he didn't know it. And apparently Satan wasn't all that sharp either. <laughs> so he comes before God and says, what about Job? And God says, well, behold, he's in your hand. So why was he in his hand? Because God wanted him to be in his hand? Because God really had it out for Job? No. God didn't want Job to suffer. But Job had pulled down the, the protection. And it's like I've always said, if you have an umbrella and you stand under the umbrella and it's raining, you're going to stay dry. But all you got to do is move that umbrella out of the way and as soon as you do, you're going to get wet. Why? Because the wet's there. <laughs> the rain's there. The sickness and disease are out there. The, the sinful activity is out there. So all you got to do is take down the hedge and suddenly... You're subject to it, unfortunately. So, what we've got to do is realize that God wants the best for us. God wants to protect us. God wants that hedge up. Now, we're going to find out some things about what Job said here. Before we do that, I want to hit a couple of things. A lot of people are going to say, well, you know, this isn't fair. This is just not fair. You know, God ought to protect us no matter what. Well, Keith Bohr said there's a, a friend of his, Mel Piper, M-E-L, Mel Piper. And Mel says, always stay on God's side. <laughs> I like that quote. Always stay on God's side. Don't go around questioning, well, it's just not fair, God. Uh, it is fair. It's God. Okay? You may not understand how it's fair yet. And one day you may. But in the meantime, stay on God's side, because he's right. Matter of fact, if anybody's wrong, it ain't God. Okay? So you can just about be guaranteed, if you've got an issue with the way God's handling things, look to yourself, not to God. God's right all the time. So we need to stay on God's side. And if you stay with it, Chances are really good you will understand at some point how and why that's the case. Now, there, the secret things belong to God. There's some things you may never know. Even once you get to heaven, you may never know them because they, they have to do with somebody else. But, hey, that's okay. It's not my business anyway. But now there are things about my situation that he may reveal to me later. You know, why'd that happen? I don't know. I'll find out. But in the meantime, I'm getting on the word. I'm staying on the word. I'm getting the hedge back up. I'm staying out in the dry out of the wet. Okay? So, Matthew 5.25. This is an interesting scripture. Uh, this is another one that we read and we misunderstand because of the way it reads. It says, this is what Jesus said, Agree with thine adversary. Now, in most cases, the adversary represents the devil. Well, certainly he's not saying agree with the devil. There is no way God's going to tell you or Jesus is going to tell you agree with the devil. We're to resist the devil and he will flee from us. Okay? So, the adversary in this case must be somebody that holds a different opinion than you do. Okay? Now, in this case, it could very well be God. God has an opinion, and you think, it's not fair. Well, now, hold on. Stay on God's side. But let's look at this. Agree with thine adversary. In this case, as a person, let's say, that's sitting, the adversary might be God, not the devil. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into the prison. Verily I said to thee that thou shalt by no means come out of thence, or out of the prison, until you've paid the uttermost farthing. In other words, until the whole thing's paid. You're going to get thrown in prison and stay there. That's judgment. Why? Because this guy, whoever he was, that Jesus is talking about, took you before the judge, and the judge said, you're wrong. He's right, you're in prison. Well, in this case, we're looking at a guy that is sinning, okay? 
God is the adversary. Well, you need to agree with the adversary quickly. Well, in this case, you agree with God quickly. God, I don't understand it all. I don't know why that this is wrong. I don't, I don't understand, but I agree with you. I repent. I don't know why I need to repent, but I repent. <laughs> Do it quickly. So it puts that scripture in a whole different light to look at it that way. Matthew uh, 5.26, Verily I say to thee, thou shalt by no means come out dead until thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Now, how are you going to pay it if you're in prison? You're kind of stuck at that point. So you don't want to be in that situation. If you and God are in disagreement, who needs to change? <laughs> Me. God won't. He is right. You need to be the one to change. Well, what is change in the New Testament? Repent. Repentance is to change and then change direction. You repent of your sin, you go in a different direction. That's repentance, which is change. Satan wants you to think that God's not fair, that he's let you down, but that has never ever happened. God has never let you down. He has never judged wrongly. He always judged righteously. Deuteronomy 32.4, God is fair. God is just. That's what it says, by the way. God is just in Deuteronomy 32.4. God is fair. God wants the best for you. Jeremiah 29.11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. See, we're talking about God's heart. It's never God's heart for you to be punished. It only occurs when it's absolutely necessary because you won't repent. God's real heart motive is that every thought I think about you are thoughts of peace and not of evil. That's God's heart. All right? But because he is the righteous judge of all the earth, he will, at some point, have to render judgment. All right, let's look at a situation that Abraham had to deal with when he was interceding for Sodom. Now, of course, we know Sodom. Sodom was committing heinous sin, homosexuality, sodomy, all that. And so Abraham is interceding for Sodom, Genesis 18.22. The other men turned and headed toward Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. Abraham approached him and said, and by the way, this is, uh, this is the New Living Translation. Uh, Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? See, this really addresses the whole issue here. Are you going to sweep away the righteous and the wicked at the same time? That's never God's intent. So what does he say? Suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you still sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Sure you wouldn't do such a thing. Destroy the righteous along with the wicked. Why, you'd be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same. Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? So what did God say? The Lord replied, If I find 50 righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare the whole city for their sake. That's pretty good. So Abraham presses it. He says, uh, then Abraham spoke again, since I have begun, let me speak further to my Lord, even though I am but dust and ashes. Suppose there are only 45 righteous people rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. Then Abraham pressed the request further. Suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of 40. Now please don't be angry, my Lord. <laughs> Abraham pleaded, let me speak. Suppose there are only 30 righteous people that are found. The Lord replied, I won't destroy it if I find 30. And then Abraham said, since I dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. <laughs> Suppose there are only 20. See, Abraham was a Jew. <laughs> okay? He said, suppose there's only 20. The Lord said, well, I won't destroy it for the sake of 20. Finally, Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me if I speak one more time. Now, notice what he said. I'm only going to speak one more time. He could have gone further. It's his choice. But he says, uh, one more time, suppose only ten are found there. The Lord replied that I will not destroy it for the sake of the ten. Well, Abraham must have thought there would bound to be at least ten in a whole city. When the Lord had finished the conversation with Abraham, he went on his way and Abraham returned to his tent. That's the New Living Translation. Well, there wasn't ten. 
So Sodom and Gabor got destroyed. Vaporized. Okay? So how do we avoid judgment? That's the real question. How do we avoid judgment? We judge ourselves. Let's think about 1 Corinthians 11.31. Now, 1 Corinthians 11 is scripture we all know. We hear it all the time. Uh, at communion, the Lord's Supper. Uh, at the very end of that, it talks about that there are people who, because they do not discern the body of the Lord correctly, are weak and sick and some have died. All right, so why is that the case? Because they haven't repented of that. Because it goes on to say, if you will judge yourself, you will not be judged. That's where that comes from, that scripture uh, comes up from. So, let's go back and think about Job, his situation. If he had repented earlier, now he eventually repented. And it's like Keith Boyle was saying when he taught, he said, you know, everybody says, well, I'm just like old Job. And Keith Boyle said, he always says, well, good. And they go, what? <laughs> but, 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 but I said I was just like Job. Well, yeah, but Job got healed. He got back double everything. I mean, he came out okay. Well, they don't think about that. Well, why? Because Job repented. He saw that he'd done wrong. He repented. And when he repented, God restored. Because that was God's real will. That was God's desire. So Job was accused by Satan. And Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12.10 says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. But Job knew that he needed an advocate between him and God. But he didn't have one. Now let's think about that. What's an advocate? The advocate's a lawyer. Here's Job standing before the judge of the universe. But he doesn't have a lawyer. And he doesn't have a covenant that covers it the way our covenant does. Now guess what? We got a lawyer. All right? So let's read about that. Job saw by revelation supernatural revelation that he needed an advocate, which is a lawyer. Is there an advocate for us? Yes. Job 16, 21, and the New King James says, Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleads for his neighbor. Job 31, 35. If only someone would listen to me. This is Job speaking. Look, I will sign my name in my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser write out the charges against me which the accuser is more than happy to do. That's the devil. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's our lawyer. So now we're picturing a court case here. And Jesus is the lawyer. We're going to get into that in just a second. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Well, here's the thing. Even after you're born again, you are subject to sin. You might just do it. I know none of you would. But I'll admit I have. Even after I got born again. But First John says that I can come and confess my sin and that God is faithful and just to cleanse me of my sin, cleanse me from all unrighteousness, and then guess what? I'm restored to a point that I am not any longer subject to the judgment. I judge myself. So, I commit the sin. Now, Blender will tell you, I will never kick the cat. You know, most people use the example, what if you kick the cat? Well, I will never kick my cat. I love my cat. She's a sweetie, so I'm not going to do that. Dog, I don't know. Joe, you know. What, what, uh, jury's out on that. But there are other things I may or may not have done. And when I do them, I have a choice. I can either let it sit there and fester and perhaps open myself up to the, the devourer, the destroyer, or I can confess it quickly. I can sign in with the Lord quickly and say, all right, Lord, I sin. You know, like Brother Copeland says, when you sin, run to God. Don't run from him. 
run to God. Say, Lord, I sinned. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Cleanse me from all the righteousness. Woo. Thank you. Now, here's the thing. Our advocate goes before the court. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, there are certain TV shows I like. And one TV show that I like is a new one called Bull. I just like that show. It's an it's a interesting show. The whole premise of Bull is that he is a trial scientist. He is a psychologist who is an expert at trials. And he has a team that's called his TAC team, T-A-C, TAC, which stands for Trial Analysis Corporation. And one thing he does, he's not a lawyer now. He just works for lawyers and for the defendant, you know. So the defendant has been accused. They've got charges written up against him, so the accuser has written the charges. And Bull comes in with his tact team, and he talks to the defendant. And he says, now look, here's what you've got to do. In other words, he preps him. He says, when you get on the stand, don't go to bawling and squalling. And said, you got me, I did it, I did it. Why? Because as soon as he says, I did it, then the judge, being a righteous judge, has got to go, oh, well, punk, you're condemned. You confessed in court. But now, the cool thing is, the fix is in. See? We confess the sin. The sin's been cleansed away. It's no longer there. So here's Satan with all of his evil minions, with their tape recorders, and their video, and they're going around following you around, and they're watching, and they, they video you doing something you shouldn't be doing. And they catch you lying. And they love to quote the scripture to you, all liars shall end up in the lake of fire. And they quote that scripture, and you're sitting there going, oh, 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 I did, I lied. Well, you confess the sin, you get cleansed. Then Satan shows up in court, all proud. And he says, okay, God, here's the video of what he did. And he plays the video and it's blank. There's nothing there. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, Demon, come over here. You had that tape recorder running? Yeah, absolutely. Did you play it back? Yep. Did you got him? I got him. All right, so play the tape. Nothing but static. Well, it, it got wiped. How did it get wiped? The blood of Jesus wiped it clean. Then your lawyer stands up and says, uh, Excuse me, Your Honor, Dad. <laughs> uh, you know, my brother over here, your son, uh, he confessed that sin. And you were faithful and just and forgave him of that sin. And it's now under my blood. And oh, by the way, uh, Exhibit A is the blood over here on the mercy seat. And the father looks over and sees the blood. And the blood, it says, speak of. So the blood is saying, innocent! Innocent! Well, guess what? God looks over and says, yeah, I don't see, I don't see any video. I don't hear any tape. Uh, all I see is the blood. The blood is yelling that he's innocent. When I see all you've got to do is listen to Bull the, and the trial uh, corporation folks, the tax folks, that told you, shut up and say you're innocent. Well, that's all you've got to do. I confessed it. I'm innocent. I'm cleansed by the blood. I stand completely clean before the Lord. And the Lord looks at you and goes, he's right. Boom, case dismissed. Well, the devil freaks out. Wait a minute, I had him dead to rights. Apparently not. You don't have a videotape. You don't have any audio. He's covered by the blood. All he had to do is judge himself. And that's all we have to do is judge yourself. Now, this whole business of, well, yeah, we're, but we're under grace. We don't have to confess sin anymore. Those folks are in big trouble. Because they're not bringing their sin and getting it cleansed. And unfortunately, that means judgment is eventually going to have to come.
And they find themselves in some really bad situations. And they scratch their heads and wonder, I thought I was supposed to be blessed. Well, they were supposed to be blessed. But they got outside the system. They got out from under the umbrella. So when it comes to confessing sin, we ought to do it quickly. When it comes to sickness and disease, Jesus bore it all, therefore we don't have to. Isaiah 53.10 it was the will of the Lord to bruise Jesus. He has put him to grief and made him sick. This is the Amplified. When you and he make his life, now notice that, when you and he make his life an offering for sin and he has risen from the dead in time to come, he shall see his spiritual offspring, that's us, Jesus' brother, God's son, he shall prolong his days, and the will and pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Hallelujah. And that's why Revelations 12, 11 says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. When you're there before the court of heaven, your testimony is, Father, I confess my sin. I'm innocent before you. You cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I thank you for the blood of Jesus, and I stand covered by the blood of Jesus. So the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Well, guess what? If we don't speak the word of our testimony, half of that whole fix for the trial is not going to work. So we need to stand there and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm covered by the blood. I plead the blood of Jesus. And that's how we stand there and say before the Lord, I am innocent. And that he confirms it by dismissing the case of the devil, just squalls and is upset, which I like. I personally find that a lovely thing, that he gets upset. Because there's nothing he can do about it. He has no evidence. The only evidence that God has accepted and exists is the blood of Jesus. So we're in good shape. When I first heard this message, I went, ooh, that's good stuff. Now you've got to get through all the judgment part <laughs> before you get to the good part. But we got to the good part. So we're good, praise God. And I made it through three pages of notes tonight. And that's a miracle of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Well, we're going we're gonna to stop here and uh, receive our offering. Uh, I don't know if you got Square Cash or PayPal or whatever, but uh, you could go ahead and use that, or if, if we have physical offering to take up, we could do that as well. So if not, then we will be dismissed. Hallelujah.